Aloha nerds, and welcome back to the Salwogs Why It's Great Gut Reaction, where I watch things and react from the gut. I am your host, the Salwog, and I did watch Stranger Things Season 4. Freaking best episode of Season 4 was the Dear Billy episode, epi episode 4 of Season 4, where we see Sally... Uh, Sally? Sandy? S Sunny? Samsonite? Sunny... Sunny, Sunny Koufax, Sadie, 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 Sadie Koufax, anyway, the redhead, so for those of you who are not watching Stranger Things, watch it, 80s throwback, it's basically like Super 8 meets Ghostbusters, you got these four uh, middle school kids who all like Dungeons and Dragons, and they discover there's a monster roaming around their town, and also there's a little girl with telekinetic powers who can move things with her mind. There's a whole government conspiracy. There's this thing called the underground or the upside down where when you go down into the, the upside down, it's basically where we are right now. But it's all dark and murky and goopy and creepy. And that is where this monster came from. So we got this whole world building thing going on. Uh, it expands to many more, many more monsters and a lot more fun. Uh, and essentially our one superhero, Eleven, uh, played by Millie Bobby Brown. I hope I'm getting that right. Uh, she basically uses her powers to save the day every, every time. It's, it's a really great uh show season one is fantastic i think season two is underappreciated i think it, it, much in the way that season one i would say season one is terminator season two is alien season two is so creepy with a little bit of aliens uh, season two is so creepy season three is basically a cartoon with a really great creepy subplot featuring eleven Everything with Eleven is, is really, for the most part, well done. Uh, and then Season 4. I gotta say, I think Season 1, 2, and 4 are the winners so far. I think 3 is the dip. But Season 4 really goes back to that Season 1 creepiness. Now we're going we're just, just staying pure creepy. New bad guy. who He's basically, you know, he's basically Freddy Krueger. And he's going. He goes into your to your memories and your dreams and haunts you and uh, ultimately does sick things to you. And in the real world, you just kind of levitate up and get destroyed, dismembered, pulled apart, harmed in whatever way it is that he needs to harm you to uh, push his plot and his goals. A uh, really great villain. And I gotta say, my favorite episode, the reason I'm bringing up Stranger Things is really, I thought episode four of Stranger Things, season four, was the best episode. We had the Running Up That Hill song by Kate Bush, which uh, I think most of us have heard before. And they had played the song, uh, Sadie, Sadie... Koufax. I don't remember, the redhead, anyway. She's... Uh, dating one of the boys. Uh, really great actress. I think definitely this is her season because she gives this fantastic performance of dealing with her. Her brother dies at the end of season three. And it's a really tragic, epic moment where they parallel the brother fighting the big monster at the end of season three. They create a parallel to that with him fighting his abusive father. So we... There's a great theme of parents and kids and family uh, and also the sort of sense of dealing with trauma as on top of that, where, you know, season one is the, the mother searching for the lost kid. Season two is the, the, the lost kid dealing both with post-traumatic stress and ultimately dealing with sort of abuse. He's continually being abused by someone and he can't talk about it. And it takes literally the whole season for him to really open up about his experiences and what he's going through. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great metaphor for things that happen that unfortunately can happen to, to, to young kids as well. As well, you know, horrible things happen to us at all ages. Uh, but, you know, there's these really great 
parallels and metaphors and things going on in the show that I think are worth watching the show for, where there's a whole other level beneath simply the science fiction aspect of it. Of course, you can enjoy it for that, but there's another level beneath it that's informing it, that's making it more important. Even if it doesn't appear to be that on the surface, that's what the movie and show is really talking about. And I think when it comes to season four, the Freddy Krueger season, Sadie's character, the redhead, uh, she plays Mad Max. Essentially, she's dealing with the post-traumatic stress. And this whole, real, this whole season is about post-traumatic stress and how it can sort of come back and get you. Uh, Freddy Krueger is, in this case, his, not, his name isn't actually Freddy Krueger, although Robert Englund does make an appearance. He's, you know, the bad guy's name is not Freddy Krueger. He doesn't have a name up front. He gets that later on in the season. But essentially, he just represents the post-trauma post coming back. And, and you know, some people can get away from it and some people can't. And I think it's, it's wonderful how ep episode four, I have to, to, to shout out to episode four. If there was nothing else worth talking about, episode four... Is just a perfect example of great writing, great direction, great performance, great editing. Because you have this character who, for four episodes, has been dealing pretty silently and pretty heavily with the, the trauma of losing her brother in a very horrific way. And based on what we know from season three, she's had a lot of trauma. That her, her father, is a, or stepfather, is a very abusive figure in both her life and her, her now late brother's life. And that abuse still lives on, but now it's the, the, the trauma of, Jesus, I lost my brother, and, and what do I do? That and, and her parents are not really around, and so she's a very isolated, lonely person. But what she has is good friends, and so she spends time with her friends, and she tries to be with her boyfriend, who is one of the main guys, but he's kind of off discovering himself. And so she she's in this very vulnerable place in her life. And this whole episode builds up to... Uh, we've already had, I think, two or three kills by the Freddy Krueger. And every time the person levitates up. And it's really, you know, it's a, it's a haunting, horrible experience that would make Freddy Krueger happy. But in this instance, what's cool is we see Sadie face the villain in his home, in his home in the upside in the upside down. At the same time as she is present physically in the real world, so there's it's like this we kind of have in this outer body experience at the same time as having. Uh, her physical body experienced something else, and her her it's like her spirit or her soul or her mind is in the upside down with this monster, and it's the song that she's always listening to. Her song of running up that hill is kind of her saving grace. She listens to it all the time. It gets her through the day, and she figures. And this this episode is where they realize that. That playing that song helps keep her away from the psychic attacks of this villain. This, 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 his, his powers can be hindered by music. That musical notes somehow throw off the ability, uh, the, the psychic attacking ability. Uh, but it builds all the way up to her actually getting you know, levitated in the air. She's almost close to dying. And they bring that Running Up the Hill song. And I never felt a song. This is what I love about music videos. When a music video is done right, in my opinion, is when it's a, a either a literal manifestation of the lyrics or if the melodrama occurring in the video somehow represents what the lyric represents. As long as it's somehow metaphorical. Because in this case, in the, up, in the Upside Down... She sees, like a hole opens in the Upside Down, and she sees her physical body ha hovering in the air, and all of her friends trying to reach and grab her and help her. And, uh, and she, hear she hears them say, run, because they start playing the music. Playing the music is what 
enables her to sort of see a pathway back to her body. And when we hear the music build up and we see her running, it's so dramatic, it's so epic. Uh, but here we have, again, the epicness is a metaphor. Her lit She's literally running from a demon. She's uh, And the whole song, one of the, the lyrics is, uh, do you want to hear about the deal where I trade places with God and I and I and I have a day off? Uh, otherwise, you're gonna see me running up that hill, trying to deal with my, trying to get away from my problems and all this stuff. It's, it's, it's you know, it, it makes in epic proportion a metaphor for what she's going through emotionally, and I think this is the true function of science fiction and fantasy. I think, again, uh, people who are not fans of this genre mistake it for, oh, you just like to see Power Rangers, blah, blah, blah. Even Power Rangers is a metaphor for together as a team, we can we can deal with or get away from or, or solve the problems that are too big for any one of us to deal with. Even, even that's a metaphor for how people coming together can solve problems. Uh, but in this case, the, the metaphor of the monster is like, this is really about this young woman running from her problems and realizing what what is a potentially healthy way to save her, to save herself from her post-traumatic stress, to save herself from this in intense depression and loneliness that she feels, is that she does have people that love her. And if she could just move forward and, and enjoy that but it took but but the what she's lost that family connection is you know this is why all the great stories are about family this is why we still know the stories of the greeks uh, when we talk about hercules being persecuted by hera his his mother uh but not his birth mother uh he, she's he's persecuted by hera because she's angry at Zeus for cheating on her with a human woman and producing a child with, with all the strength. And she's so angry and bitter over this scenario that she punishes the son, even though the son, he had no choice in it, you know. Uh, but those, these family ties that are so personal and, and begrudging, we can understand and connect with. Uh, but on that level, she's dealing with this, 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 the trauma of the loss, the trauma and the loneliness, the, the loneliness of dealing with something that the people around you, even if they love you, even if they do want to be there for you, maybe they can't understand, or maybe you're not ready to open up to them. And although on the surface, it may appear like, Hey, just buck up and cheerio, carry, keep calm and carry on. Even on the surface, that sounds like a great thing to say to someone. In reality, when you're dealing with that level of personal loss and pain and, and years of abuse and all that stuff going on, I mean, in a way, like, she's literally emotionally going through that level of pain. Uh, a Freddy Krueger would not have to exist in a, in a literal sense for her to still be dealing with that personally and emotionally all on the inside. This is something I definitely relate to. I've been through a lot of stuff that I had to deal with for a very long time. And it is like running up a hill and you just can't quite reach the top. You can't quite get over it. And that's what she's dealing with literally. And uh, so very much of a lot of episode four is her writing her last letters to people. She thinks she's going to die. And... And maybe she wants to. And, and literally the, the, you know, spoiler alert, in the finale, she has a discussion again with the, with the bad guy. And he says, no, you want to die. Otherwise, I would not have come to you. You've wished for it many times. I heard it. Otherwise, I would not have picked you. And finally, in the finale, she admits that, yes, you're right. But, but... And that's the thing that's great about her character is that she has so many levels to it. She she does see the outside of her scenario. She does see that she has people that are that she loves that she wants to be around. She does see that there's something to live for, but she does admit to yes, I did want to die. The moment my brother died, I wanted to die too. I you know to to not have him, even though he was an asshole. 
she she understood what made him an asshole. She understood that that in the la in his last moments he still defended her. Like part of the trauma is that not just that he died, but he died protecting her because he had spent all of season two controlling and being mean to her and speaking abusively and trying to control her life. But in his very last moments, he had decided to protect her from the monster. And again, with the parallel of the abusive father that they both share, uh, in essence, protecting her from the father too. That's the, the, the metaphor is there. That's what that metaphor exists for. That, you know, perhaps if he had lived, maybe they could have gotten that, gotten to that place in their actual lives. Now, the A movie, the drama with no monsters in it would do that, probably. But here we are, the fantasy, the, the accessible fantasy presents us a metaphor so that we can talk about those things without having to say them directly. But we can still have that conversation. And so when the music kicks in and she runs and it's dramatic the drama holds again because we've watched everything that led up to it but also the editing is cutting back to all the appropriate flashbacks that make us like oh god oh it's hitting me oh it hurts and it, and it feels like a music video and it, it's it's emotional and it's powerful and it's potent and her performance is so real and raw i think you know this whole notion that we don't have uh uh, superstars anymore I think is kind of bullshit I think yes we are in a time where superheroes are popular and, and characters are famous but the truth is those characters were already famous just because you normies just heard of them doesn't mean they didn't exist before and I'm one of you normies but even I have heard of Iron Man and War Machine before you know everyone who didn't know of them saw iron man i knew of those characters before i knew of dr strange all of these characters existed in the 90s cartoon ghost rider uh just because the normal audience member who doesn't usually watch comic book or superhero related stuff doesn't know ghost rider doesn't mean that you know oh well only characters are famous now that is such a that doesn't even make any sense Stranger Things is a phenomenon where you, I mean, Eleven, uh, Millie, that actress has been in a ton of stuff since Stranger Things came out. And uh, really, Sadie is, is right now in The Whale, which everyone is saying is a great film and her performance is fantastic. I think the Stranger Things kids are stars. I think this whole notion of there's no stars anymore, I think it's just, it's just different. What we have is this oversaturation of media that makes it hard to differentiate what we should be paying attention to. But I think everyone can agree. Anyone who has Netflix can agree. The, the, the kid actors of Stranger Things are freaking stars. They're, they're all phenomenal actors. The writing is great. Gives them lots of stuff to chew on. And definitely the female leads have some of the best written material on the show. I think Eleven's Journey... My other favorite episode is Eleven's flashback and escape uh, when we see her backstory with all the other numbers in her little group when we, oh, there was other numbers. And it wasn't like they were all separated like her. Actually, there's a whole reason we don't see them. Her epic conclusion where she gets her powers back after a whole season of not having them, that, that was very cinematic. Like, that was... Where I would say the, the Sadie episode of Running Up That Hill, episode four, is I would say the best episode in terms of writing, in terms of just perfect execution. I would say the the, the 11 episode of Getting Her Powers Back is is the best in terms of scope, in, in terms of cinema. As in, if this played in theaters, when you see her get back up from her, from her underground facility where they're trying to train her to get her powers back and the government has come in to try and kill her and you see her just totally go go freaking rage carry two on these military vans and vehicles and, and trash them and destroy them with her mind that stuff is incredible that is just incredibly well shot it looks like a movie if it had been on the big screen I would have said this was a movie 
I think season four accomplishes a lot. I think the finale kind of drags a little bit, but also it kind of intentionally drags because it wants to save its final cliffhanger to the very last moment. Uh, I think overall season four is just so good. And it has some cartoon elements with the whole Russia stuff, but at least we get the Demi-Gorgon back and it is some cool sequences. I feel like where She-Hulk struggled with knowing where to put that CGI, you can definitely see with Stranger Things uh, that they knew where exactly to put that CGI, how long to use it, and, and the, the storytelling knew how to use it effectively so that you could still have really good drama and really great characters. And that's the whole thing. You have to have great characters. If you're not invested in the characters themselves, like... Uh, I remember I had a coworker who was pushing me to watch this, and she was like, "There's a there's a character who's just like you. He's a stoner, and uh, it's the pizza guy, the Pacific Pizza. Try the pineapple. You ain't lived if you haven't tried it. I don't know if I'm saying it right. He's basically a Cheech and Chong ripoff, but he's fantastic. The the guy talk about another great performance. You know that the pizza guy is one of the great characters that holds the show together because everyone else is dour and serious. Uh, we we have the one the one kid who was missing and dealing with the the abuse from the 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 creepy monster gods. That kid is is dealing with his his closeted gayness like he's gay, and it's the '80s, so it's really not a great time to be coming out yet. You know what I mean? So he's dealing with that completely privately and he can't, he just can't bring it up because he knows how people are going to act, but having him deal with that throughout the whole season. And I just was like so blown away with how it was written. Well, I think, you know, you can tell uh, shitty writing when you see a gay character is just a flamboyant flapping his hands, feminine thing. They're not even a character. They're not even a person. They're just a feminine thing, really. That you know, and not that there aren't gay people who act like that, but when that's the only form of gay person, you know that the writer probably is living in L.A., drinks too much coffee, and you know that's their perception of gay people. When there's totally gay people who just just talk how I'm talking right now. Like I, I worked as an editor in college for a, a guy who was a gay guy and he just taught he taught again he had a big beard he just talked normal he just not he wasn't flipping his hand or being all about coffee and macchiatos you know what i mean he's just a normal my, my best friend while i was in college was from my high school and he was gay and he, he just talked normal you know what i mean maybe maybe there's a little feminine tinge here and there but he was just just talked normal he just like you know, just like our whole, for the longest time, our racist conceptions, a lot of it from the movies and TV, where, you know what I mean? Like, you see, for the longest time, the only time you saw an Asian, when they had the accent on movies and shows, but in real life, you see Asian Americans, they just talk normal, like this, and that's that's how you know that the, the writer and the director and the producers just ain't lived outside their little box but what i like about stranger things is that these people the show itself tells you these people live outside the box they've met real people they know real people they know what real life actually is and they can understand how the monster is the metaphor how the monster represents the wickedness in man how the, the Freddy Krueger guy represents post-traumatic stress in this particular iteration, where the actual Freddy Krueger movie is literally about your nightmares attacking you, uh, or your worst fears attacking you. And in the case of Stranger Things Season 4, this is, this is about your, your history attacking you. Where again, ep Eleven's episode about getting her powers back is all about flashbacks. It's about her traumatic history coming back to her that she had not dealt with and uh that that that's a parallel with sadie's character and they're both best friends you know her sadie's flashbacks or mad max's flashbacks with 11 are some of the memories that keep her alive that keep her going throughout this whole season 
and uh, these these parallels, these emotional parallels, are important for the storytelling, but they're also important for what the theme of the show is all about. Uh, this is not understood enough with movies and shows that uh, whatever the theme is, that is what the movie's actually about. Uh, when ba going back to my high school, uh, there's this teacher, Mr. Herford, who really understood, who was really trying to teach the students, uh, basically an easy offhand way to write, to write well. And he presented us with a basic essay format. He's like, this is not necessarily the collegiate essay format, but this is a way for you, you can essentially use this format to write sentences in that essentially if you plug your thoughts into these sent formats, you have essentially written an essay correctly. The whole point is to give you a structure to present your thoughts. And in that structure, he talks about when you write your essay, you have to think about when you're talking about this book, you got to look at the book. What is the theme? The theme is not just one thing. It's not just courage. It's courage versus fear. It's justice versus vengeance. It's like when you talk about something, you have to have multiple levels going on here, and it's got to be about the conflict or the comparison. It's got to be, or the analysis about how both of these things interact with each other, because that is what creates deeper writing. It's more than one dimensional writing. And so, looking at Stranger Things, we're dealing with post traumatic stress, we're dealing with flashbacks, we're dealing with memories, and it's really about sort of can you grow? Can you move on? Sort of moving forward versus, you know, staying back. You know what I mean? Versus holding yourself back. And can you do that? That's very much what the season's about because they're just dealing with really the emotional consequences of the three seasons that happened before this season, which is really great writing. I think a lot of shows forget about that. I think in the case of like, you know, Call it a drinking game every time I bring up The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight Rises. Batman is retired for eight years because of his post-traumatic stress of losing so many people that he cared about in, in the previous two movies. Uh, so in that movie, is about him. Can you, can you rise? Can you actually pick yourself up uh, after dealing with so much stuff? Uh, and the, so Dark Knight Rises, Stranger Things have parallels between each other in terms of being about can you overcome your past? Uh, that All that stuff, the layers, the depth, that's what makes great writing. That is truly the stuff that makes a show great, that makes people remember it. Uh, you know, 40 years from now, people are going to say the same things that they said when you know, Transformers 2007 came out. Wow, what great visuals. Man, Shia LaBeouf is loud. They're always going to say the same thing because that is the only thing that really happens in that movie. The, there is There are arcs. They are there, but they're not the focus of the movie. It's a spectacle movie. It's all about the fun and the visual and, and all that fun stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, when you break it down, there's not as much to talk about in terms of the storytelling, how the action scenes relate to the storytelling, or it's just not there. Whereas you see the action scenes in particular, we're talking about, again, going back to episode four of this season, her running against that hill, running up that hill, running out of the gross, creepy, upside down house of the villain trying to get to her back to her body and trying to get her life back you know that's an action sequence because the you know the monster is throwing everything at her he's literally trying to bring his own world down to keep her from escaping uh and that could be seen as a metaphor for herself in her own mind she's torturing herself and destroying her own world in order to keep herself from growing and to keep herself from finding happiness despite or even because of the pain that she's suffering. And uh, it's, it's, I, this is just, I just really couldn't believe just how well done that particular episode was. I really do feel like it was perfect. The, uh, the 11 flashback episode 
as close to perfect as it gets, but not as perfect as Sadie's Mad Max's episode four. Uh, so I really just want to get that out. I think these are the important things to note that when you watch something, does it have multiple layers going on? Does it have metaphors going on? Does it have a theme that's that's present, even if it's not clearly stated? Does it have a theme that's present without being stated? And they, you can state the theme. Again, citing the Dark Knight trilogy, uh, they have multiple themes. You know, you you are... You're not what you say, you are what you do. And uh, why do we fall? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. These are sort of the, the thematic fabric of those movies. And when it comes to Stranger Things, it's like, uh, it's about children and the unfortunate things that happen to children. And here you are as a kid, you're growing up. What are you going to choose to do? Because the villain, spoiler alert here, the villain too was a child. He was like 11, but he became corrupt. And uh, what were what would have been traumatic for other characters, for him, was fun. And he fell into his own darkness. And he, he, he's, he chose that. He made a choice. And it's about our main characters don't want that. And they're struggling so hard against it. And I think Mad Max represents the literal struggle as her brother was totally, again, he fell into it. He's like, okay, I'm abused, so I'll abuse everybody else. I will totally just go right into that trap of behaving the way I was treated and not really caring how things go. So, uh, and Mad Max representing the rebellion would never behave that way. She was a little distant. She didn't necessarily want to mix with people. But deep down, she did want those things. So she did want to be a, a good person and have good friends and have all that stuff. But it took time. It took the persistence of genuinely good people. When she realized that they were genuine and they weren't going to one-up her. They weren't trying to do things for their own gain. They weren't trying to take advantage of her. When, once she realized that, then she joined their group. And that's the, because she knew. She already knew. She's the one paying attention. You know, following abuse and following mistreatment and control does not lead to happiness. And I'm not going to go down that path. And that's what the boys and Eleven represent to Mad Max. It's genuine friendships, genuine family, genuine connection. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it's uh, the, the notion of the chosen family, because we don't see her family. Uh, we don't know about her actual dad. We only know about the dad of her brother. You know, they're, they're step-siblings. Uh, so all this stuff... All of this stuff going on in this show just makes it a great show for me, in the sense that it has those layers and levels there. And you can find them if you look hard enough. You don't need, and the, the, the great thing about the show is that you don't have to look that hard to enjoy it. If you want to just enjoy Stranger Things as a fun, sci-fi, thriller, creepy show that's like a little bit of Super 8 and a little bit of Aliens and a little bit of Ghostbusters all kind of merged into one, you can enjoy it. But underneath that, just understand that there's a reason the emotions get you. There's a reason the stories get you, and it's because the work is put into those stories. There's multiple things going on meant to make connections to you. It's not just there by happenstance. It was designed to be there. Uh, and that the, the focus and effort into those layers, the metaphors, the storytelling, all of that is key to making a show that's memorable and that is a hit. And making these people stars. Because I genuinely feel... And again, uh, the, the, one of the main guys uh, in Stranger Things is in Ghostbusters Afterlife. And that, that was a really strong movie. So we're seeing, And then uh, all the kids in House of the Dragon look exactly like that kid. So as far as I'm concerned, he's in House of the Dragon too. You know what I mean? So... Uh, it's, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, this, this Stranger Things is a touchstone. I, I genuinely believe that all those kids are stars. Uh, and it's, it's looking like, uh, Sadie, Mad Max, Sadie, redhead, young, great actress lady. I'm sorry I forgot your name. I'm so sorry. 
Um, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm terrible. But it's a gut reaction, so I'm not expected to know anything. But if, seriously, she was so standout. I, I on it, and, and from what I hear about the whale, sounds like she delivers it again. I'm very excited to see what this actress does in the future because, you know, even though this show is populated with great actors, even like the show Lost, there's still, even amongst a whole sea of great actors, there's still just a couple that are just heads above everyone else and you don't know why. Maybe it's the writing, maybe it's just chance, but whatever it is, there's something about that actor or actress that's just, just like, this person's got got it on a whole nother level and and it could again could just be the fact that it's a great great written character and a great opportunity for the actor who can deliver it but in my mind this is what makes them all stars dustin's a freaking star man like he's he's showing up in movies and shows uh and i just think all these actors are going to do great in the future i cannot wait to see what happens to them as they grow and i hope they stay off of drugs and stay on a straight path you know, don't get get mixed up with those creeps in Hollywood. You know, stay on the straight path, kids, because they just they're such great. I know they're all like almost twenty now. It's like they're not even kids anymore. Um, but I really just feel like these these actors for sure are are totally rock stars, and I think we're going to be enjoying them for many years, playing many great and interesting roles. Uh, so long as they choose to really just pick stuff that either challenges them or is just genuinely interesting to watch. So uh, that's what I have to say about Stranger Things Season 4, my favorite episode. Literally, I have two favorite episodes, and they're both dealing with flashbacks for the main female characters. I think just damn great writing. Great performance, Millie, Millie Bob Brown, Millie Bob Thornton. I don't know your name either, Eleven. Fantastic performance on Eleven's side. Um, and yeah, so, yeah, that's what I got to say about Stranger Things. It's finally off my chest. So, if I left something out, I'm sorry. Uh, I, this is, again, my gut reaction. This is just the stuff I'm responding to because it just, it sat with me for this long. I saw it months ago, but it still lives with me how well done those episodes were. So, if you haven't seen Stranger Things 4 and uh, you're like, dang, you just spoiled the whole thing for me. You're welcome. Go watch it anyway, because trust me, it's worth it. So, aloha. Thank you for watching. I guess the next episode is going to be about uh, Rick and Morty. Who the frick knows? Oh, uh, yeah.